Dr. Barbara Nye at Dartmouth-Hitchcock Medical Center and the Geisel School of Medicine and the co-director of the Headache Center uh, at Dartmouth. So that's an interesting question, and we don't actually have all the numbers for that. There was a good study out of the Netherlands published in 2004 and 2007. About 26% of patients um, that became female um, actually adopted migraine characteristics, which is about the same as the general population. And so that is the most um, complete data set that we have. We do know hormones play a role in headache. Um, exactly what role they play, I think we're still trying to figure out because we know that the drop in estrogen during the regular menstrual cycle that a female has can trigger a headache. So it's a relative drop, not necessarily the absolute number is the best believed mechanism. Um, and interestingly, patients that are taking hormone therapy are often suppressing some hormones and then keeping more consistent levels rather than having peaks and valleys, uh, or at least big peaks and valleys in their hormone levels, we presume. Again, there's a lack of data to tell us exactly what's going on in these patients. Um, but it is interesting that it may be with the male to female transition with the use of estrogen that they approach migraine frequency that mimics the general population. The data for the female to male uh, transgender population is unfortunately even less um, available and we can't really see a trend there based on the currently available literature. I don't think it's ever the primary thing because it's got you have the underlying genetics and a lot of the studies unfortunately didn't uh, again take into account whether or not patients had migraines to start with. Um, these uh, there were about five studies that I found out there um, originally, um, and some of them characterized headaches before transitioning, but no one used ICHD3 criteria except for this Netherlands study that I previously mentioned. And so again, we don't know the whole picture. I think it's part of the picture. I think it's um, kind of like what we're finding out with the mechanism of migraine itself. It's never just one thing. It's the genetics. It's how much CGRP. It's, it's bits and pieces. So it's probably that Swiss cheese lining up in that perfect circumstance. A lot to do with stigma, I would say. Um, and then there's a lack of research and data to help guide providers. And then there's this uncomfortable level of, I can treat people that are taking hormones for um, just birth control, but what do I do with these higher level of hormones? And what are the risk factors associated with it? We know that estrogen can cause cardiac problems and um, hot flashes, and um, it actually has the side effect profile for the use of estrogen. And again, I'm going back more to the estrogen because there's, that's where more of the data is, but um, estrogen's dangerous in many ways uh, at high doses, and uh, folks that are transitioning are using high doses of estrogen, um, much higher than what we use for birth control levels, which have historically actually come down over the years, um, and may be playing a role in kind of the stroke risk that female have, females have over males, um, especially in the migraine with aura population. They should be treated much like the uh, normal everyday patient coming into the clinic. I think we do have to consider hormones in the mix and kind of um, assessing whether the headaches got worse around the time of hormone uh, transition. Um, and was there a threshold with those medications? So working closely with the endocrinologist to kind of determine some of those things. Um, patients are very invested in their care. Um, and I've had patients both that are invested to the point where they don't disclose where that kind of uh, tipping point is because they really uh, want to identify more with the sex that um, they're transitioning to. Um, and so they're willing to take, I think, some additional risks. Um, but there are other patients that I have that um, feel that kind of the medical risks that we discuss are higher and they're willing to work with us a little bit more on being honest about when do they think that these uh, problems got worse and if it is actually related to the hormone therapy. 
Um, I have, um, I follow many patients um, that are transgendered, um, and um, it's really interesting to see um, that the mentality is different among different, um, uh, I guess, age populations because um, they've had to deal, um, the stigma has been very different over the years, um, and it's much more accepted now. Uh, it's still not great, um, which is unfortunate, um, but the um, some of my older patients have come to the point that if they feel that the hormones are really causing a problem, they're willing to give up the hormones, and they've come to a point in their life that the hormonal side is not as important to them as much as the way they're being treated by their colleagues and friends. Um, and their providers, in fact. Um, and so we're very careful to make sure we ask about preferences, about names and how they've changed and how they prefer to be addressed. I think number one, it's not about asking, it's about listening. <laughs> um, and I think um, that is a skill that good providers have, um, is asking open-ended questions um, and listening to your patient. Um, often the EMR uh, identifies them by their birth gender and not by uh, their transitioned gender or the gender that they identify with. And I think it's important that we document in our charts and look at our chart before we see our patient to appropriately um, call out their name appropriately, to uh, refer to them in the right gender um, context, um, because that's where they identify, and that's where you end up building a therapeutic relationship. So more than questions asked, I think it's about listening. Um, I think by being open with their providers, um, uh, some people are in different phases of their transition and sometimes it's harder to tell um, where they are in that transition and so sometimes disclosing those facts to their provider is very important um, and helping us by uh, putting a, the different providers uh, in contact with each other um, and being willing to share their medical information among the different providers.